In this lesson video, we're going to work our way closer to the kinetic model by trying to understand what is the idea of an ideal gas. Now, an ideal gas is a theoretical idea. It's a simplification that lets us solve problems. In the real world, we don't work with ideal gases, but a lot of the gases we do work with approximate pretty well to an ideal gas. It's useful. And anyway, if we're going to understand the complex real world, we should probably make sure that we can understand a simplification of it first. So let's get into it and go through the five properties of an ideal gas. We'll do it by using my friend Mr. Rothwell's lovely mnemonic, FRIES. F stands for forces. There are no intermolecular, intermolecular forces. This is what we often imagine gases to be like anyway, since we consider that boiling a liquid breaks the bonds. But this goes a bit further, stating that the gas molecules that are moving around don't attract or repel one another at all. They just fly around and bounce off one another. The big, big significance of this, though, is that we can ignore potential energy. So an ideal gas has zero internal potential energy. We'll come back to that in another lesson video, so store it away. R stands for rapid random motion. You've probably, well hopefully, learned about Brownian motion before, and this relates to that. Brownian motion is the visible movement of large particles, such as pollen or smoke, that move randomly in a zigzag pattern. Brownian motion is caused by small invisible particles in a fluid hitting the large particles from random directions. The small particles, such as air particles, are able to move the large smoke particles because they are traveling very fast, so they have large momentum and kinetic energy. The gas particles have rapid random motion. I stands for impact time, which is negligible. When a golf ball bounces on concrete, it has very little impact time and it doesn't squash much and lose much energy. When a football hits the ground, it squashes down, then expands again, and it takes time. It loses energy in this time and interacts with the floor. In an ideal gas, none of that happens. Impact time is negligible, so there's no interaction between the particles. E stands for elastic, in that all collisions are elastic. All right, so all that means is that no energy is lost in any collision. And S stands for small spheres. The volumes of the particles are negligible compared to the total volume of the gas. This is simply enough, so we'll treat all particles as a small sphere, almost like a point mass. And this makes some of the maths work better. So those rules of fries are for an ideal gas. All that means that if we have a gas and it obeys these rules, then it is an ideal gas. If we have a gas and it does not obey all those rules, then it's not an ideal gas. Many gases are pretty close to following these rules, so the formulas and things we're going to look at next, those formulas that only truly work for ideal gases, they are going to be useful for us. So what formulas are we going to look at? A gas has four measurable properties, which are all related to one another. Pressure, temperature, volume, and number of particles. If you're unfamiliar with this, please go and have a look at my lesson videos from GCSE that cover Boyle's law and the pressure law. You should go and do that right now, really. But here's a quick overview. If we take a box and put a gas in it, like so, three particles for now, it's an ideal gas, by the way. Now, pressure is caused by collisions with the wall, not other particles. So this particle here is exerting a force due to its change in momentum, of course, and so there is a pressure on the wall. If we increase the temperature, the particles move more quickly. This means a greater change in momentum and more frequent collisions with the walls. So the pressure goes up. P is proportional to T. 
if we increase the volume, the collisions become less frequent, so pressure goes down. P is proportional to 1 over V. If we increase the number of particles, there are more collisions per unit time, so the pressure goes up. P is proportional to N, the number of moles. Combining all of this, we can say that P is proportional to NT over V. Let's put in a constant of proportionality, R. So, P equals R NT over V, or PV equals NRT. Pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar gas constant R multiplied by the temperature in Kelvin. The molar gas constant has a value of 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin and is simply the constant of proportionality for this relationship. One last thing though, what if we want to put in terms of the number of particles rather than the number of moles? Well, there's a simple relation using another constant, the Boltzmann constant, K. I like to remember it by K equals R over Na. So the Boltzmann constant is the molar mass constant, sorry, the molar gas constant, divided by Avogadro's constant. This means that our formula, PV equals NRT, becomes PV equals N, Na, Kt. And since the number of moles, N, multiplied by the number of particles in a mole, which is what Avogadro's number is, is equal to the number of particles n, we get PV equals nKt. This is extremely powerful, but deceptively simple. Think about it. We have just written down a formula relating pressure, volume, temperature, and moles of a gas. Think about that for a moment. Temperature is in this, and we used to just think of temperature as a measure of a kinetic energy, but there's no energy in this equation. We're relating temperature purely to the number of particles, the volume and the pressure. This is fantastic because now, finally, we have a way to look at temperature that does not rely on a material, does not rely on water. We can take any ideal gas, measure its volume, pressure, and number of particles, and know its temperature. This is the thermodynamic scale, and this is the sort of thing I love physics for. And to think, we used to just rely on human body temperature.